Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Stephen Park. And today I'm going to talk about how sleep apnea causes dementia and what you can do about it to prevent it. Now, dementia is one of the most feared medical conditions and for good reason. It's an umbrella term used to describe a chronic condition that affects your memory, thinking and social abilities and this impairs your daily life. It's estimated that around 6 million seniors in the US have Alzheimer's disease. It's also estimated that by 2060, around 14 million people in the US will have some type of dementia. And this is more common in African-Americans and Hispanics than Caucasians, and more common in women than men. And about one third of people over age 85 will have some type of dementia. The most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which is about 60 to 80% of all causes of dementia. You also have vascular dementia, frontal temporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, and mixed dementia. Now, imagine your mother or father not remembering your name or especially their grandchildren's names. Their gradual mental, cognitive, emotional, and physical decline takes a heavy toll on your entire family. And difficult decisions have to be made regarding the need for caretakers or placement in nursing facilities. So this website from Mayo Clinic has a good summary of dementia. I'm gonna go over this. Now, there are many reasons that are proposed for dementia. All have in common temporary or permanent loss of brain function or cells. Besides the five types of dementia I mentioned before, there are a long list of other more rare conditions on the left, such as traumatic brain injury, Huntington's, Parkinson's, kurtzfeldt jacob disease, which are not generally reversible. And the list on the right are potentially reversible dementias. But sleep apnea is not mentioned at all, but rather included in another list of risk factors that you can change, as seen in the next slide. Notice that sleep disturbances is near the bottom, and this encompasses all types of sleep problems and not just sleep apnea. But you can see the other um, risk factors like poor diet, lack of exercise, excess of alcohol, cardiovascular risk factors, depression, diabetes, smoking, air pollution, head trauma, sleep problems, vitamin nutritional deficiencies, and certain medications that can worsen your memory. However, it's estimated that about 25 to 30% of men and 9 to 17% of women in the US have sleep apnea. Rates are much higher as you get older, as you gain weight, and more men than women until around age 50 when women start to catch up. We know that untreated moderate to severe sleep apnea significantly raise your risk of any of the following. High blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, heart attack, atrial fibrillation, stroke, seizures, dementia, depression, memory problems, glaucoma, cancer, ADHD, pregnancy complications, infertility, car accidents, erectile dysfunction, and even hearing loss. And this is a short list. I think we can all agree that there's some degree of overlap between dementia and sleep apnea, but what's a true degree of overlap? Could it be a much greater degree? So in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to argue for this, that the overlap is much bigger than you think. Now, one of the major hallmark features of sleep apnea is what's called intermittent hypoxia, meaning repeated episodes of low oxygen levels and reoxygenization. Every time you have an apnea, your oxygen level can drop to below 80%. And sometimes in severe cases, it can go down to even below 70%, which is very dangerous. The only thing that saves you is that you'll wake up, but this life-threatening reflex is what ultimately ruins your sleep quality. Here you can see that the oxygen level is at 77%, which is not good. And these are some of the consequences of months or years of untreated sleep apnea. This is a study from UCLA by Dr. Ron Harper, someone who I interviewed a while back in one of my podcasts. In this study, they used a specialized version of MRI machines called a diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, to measure brain nerve tissue damage. In untreated sleep apnea subjects, there were multiple areas in the brain that were damaged, as shown in the yellow-orange areas of the image. And the affected areas included the medulla, cerebellum, cerebellar uh, peduncles, ventrolateral temporal lobes, dorsal temporal white matter, occipital cortex, the hippocampus, the putamen and this is the cortex. And needless to say, all these areas are critical to brain functioning properly. Now, we also know that intermittent hypoxia is also shown to cause buildup of amyloid plaques, which is the classic hallmark for Alzheimer's disease. This has been shown in both rats and humans. In this study, they compared 17 patients with untreated apnea to controls, looking at brain damage by MRI and cognitive testing for after three months of CPAP. The top row shows areas of gray matter brain loss at baseline with untreated apnea. 
The middle row shows gray matter increases after CPAP for three months, including the hippocampus right about here, which is involved with memory. And cognitive testing improved as well. So this study proves that the brain is able to regenerate, at least partially. We also know that sleep apnea can cause silent brain damage. In this systematic review and meta-analysis, using MRIs, they found that there were 2.3 times more white spots and 1.7 times more asymptomatic lacunar infarcts in people with sleep apnea. And this systematic review and meta-analysis from 2021 found strong associations between sleep apnea and all neurocognitive disorders, including all-cause dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease, but not vascular dementia. And this study looked at the rate of white matter findings and the lacunar infarcts in relation to sleep apnea severity and found that for mild sleep apnea, the relative risk was 1.7 times, but for moderate and severe sleep apnea, the risk was four times higher. So this is the white matter uh, areas that, that they found, and these are the lacunar infarcts, basically like black holes. So the more severe your sleep apnea, the more of these things you're going to find. And many times it's not symptomatic until the very end. So now you may be asking, if you have sleep apnea, can you slow the rate of dementia or stop it at all by treating sleep apnea? So in this systematic review of 11 such studies that they found in 2022, nine out of these 11 found that using CPAP had a protective effect on myocognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. And they concluded that treatment delayed age at myocognitive impairment onset, reduced myocognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease incidence, and slowed cognitive decline or progression to Alzheimer's disease. So it did make a difference. And one of the studies mentioned previously was this one from Dr. Kathy Richards, who found that there was a moderate to large effect size on the psychomotor cognitive processing speeds at one year in people with mild cognitive impairment and sleep apnea. And it's not just for CPAP. The UPPP palate operation was also found to help as well. So remember that I mentioned in the past webinar that despite only a 40 to 60% success rate for this operation, you're technically 100% compliant as opposed to a relatively low compliance rate for CPAP. The x-axis is survival from a dementia diagnosis, and the y-axis is time over nine years. So the top row here shows survival for the control group versus the sleep apnea over nine years. So notice how the sleep apnea people, the survival was not as good over time. But if you go to the UPPP operation over here, you know that, notice that the survival rate is much higher for the pilot operation. So are you convinced? Obviously, sleep apnea is not the only reason for dementia, but perhaps much more important than what you thought previously, right? Now, dementia may be the tip of the iceberg poking through the top, but without addressing what's underneath, dementia is unlikely to get better. So below the surface, you have metabolic factors such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and high blood pressure, and also lifestyle dietary factors over here. But notice why I place sleep apnea even deeper than the lifestyle, diet, and metabolic factors. Also, note that you don't see genetics on this slide. Yes, there are certain genetic risk factors, but your lifestyle and environment and the quality of your diet and sleep far outweighs any genetic predispositions. Now, we know that facial shrinking contributes to airway problems. Notice in this study, looking at high school yearbook portraits, faces are much more narrow and taller than over 100 years ago. Notice they're much more rounder and wider. This is for both boys and girls. And this is a list of factors that prevents proper facial development, which leads to airway crowding. The lists on the left are historically documented to aggravate facial shrinkage and dental crowding. So soft diets, bottle feeding, thumb sucking, pacifier use, native ingestion. On the right are some of my hypotheses backed up by studies in humans or animals that suggest that they can theoretically retard proper facial growth. And here are the studies to back it up. So this study found that children who are born before 32 weeks had much higher rates of sleep apnea. So obviously they had underdevelopment of the faces and, and bones as well. And glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup and most of the genetically modified foods, alters a substance called chondroitin sulfate, which is the precursor for proper bone and cartilage development. And in this study, rats given fluoride caused retardation of the soft palate shelf bones. So the palate didn't develop properly. And as long as we're on the subject of fluoride, I wanted to mention this study which is a large systematic review and meta-analysis from Harvard, which found that communities with fluoride in the water had significantly lower IQ levels. And going back to facial development, rats exposed to aluminum in the drinking water altered bone and cartilage growth. You can find aluminum in certain cookware, as well as in many of our children's vaccines. 
And we've known for years that aluminum may be a major risk factor for dementia as shown in this drinking water study. If you combine aluminum and fluoride together, there may be a synergistic effect on dementia with higher levels leading to worse outcomes. This is why when you try to address dementia by itself, you have to look at the big picture rather than trying to get rid of the plaque or prevent their buildup with medications. So here are six things you can do to prevent or delay dementia. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, take care of it completely. Work with your doctor to make sure whatever treatment option you choose, it works to help you sleep much better. And treating sleep apnea is important because the more slow wave sleep or deep sleep you get, the more amyloid plaque is removed. Also, the more your deep sleep is disturbed, the more insulin resistance you'll have, which can lead to diabetes and obesity, which can lead to more sleep apnea. Number two is just follow basic sleep hygiene rules. So no eating late, no lights at night, it's about two to three hours before bedtime, especially the screens. And you want to sleep, go to bed and wake up at the same time seven days a week. And the important thing about screens is that the blue light lowers your melatonin level, which is your sleep hormone. Number three, cut down on carbohydrates dramatically. Like most of us do tend to eat too many carbohydrates. Uh, and this can aggravate diabetes, which can certainly damage your brain. You also want to increase your healthy fats. And don't worry about saturated fats as long as it's from a healthy source. Because this, this also helps to absorb fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin D, which also helps help to lose weight, um, which also lowers your risk of diabetes. There's also less concern for red meat and meat in general. Because most of the more recent prospective studies are showing that red meat is not any more dangerous than not eating it at all. All of the older studies that showed increased risk of red meat were observational with memory recall questionnaires, which are highly inaccurate. And if you're worried about high cholesterol and high fat foods and meats, take a look at these studies. This is a meta-analysis of five major studies after 1995. And those, especially in men, people with the lowest cholesterol levels had the highest mortality rates. Uh, same for women, and especially for men, only for men who had the highest cholesterol levels had a lower uh, death rate, but that didn't show up for, show up for women. And this is a study from the Netherlands in 1997. And so on the left here is your cum cumulative all-cause mortality. And if you look at the people with the lowest cholesterol levels, they have the highest mortality. People with the highest cholesterol level had the uh, lowest mortality. And this is the reverse. Um, this is survival or longevity. So notice that the people with the lowest cholesterol levels have the lowest survival rates. Now, there's some concern about dementia while taking statins to lower high cholesterol, uh, but this study didn't find any worsening dementia. However, other studies do show mixed results. We know that there are lots of documented cases where there's significant degree of short-term memory problems and forgetfulness for people taking statin medications. So this is an ongoing debate. Number four, it's also known that there are many prescription medications and even some over-the-counter medications that can aggravate dementia. And we know that almost 90% of adults over 65 are taking a prescription medication and 25% take on average about five medications. And some of the more common offenders include antihistamines, anticholinergics, proton pump inhibitors, the acids, the benzodiazepines like Valium, uh, sleeping, many sleeping pills, and many psychiatric medications as well. Number five is watch what's in your water. So a lot of the water is contaminated and many areas can have lead, mercury, aluminum, or arsenic and many other countless poisons. Now, this is a screenshot from the Environmental Working Group. And you can actually go to this website, put in your zip code, and you'll find out what's in your water. This area that I searched for is next to where my son goes to college in upstate New York. And notice how, if you look at arsenic, it's 1,700 times higher than the recommended guideline, which is 0.004 parts per billion. And in this area, it's at 1,700 times higher and other much higher rates than the other uh, toxic chemicals as well. And we talked about fluoride and aluminum in the past. So definitely check your water supply, go to the environmental working group and put in your zip code. And the solution for this is to either drink bottled water that doesn't have fluoride or install a reverse osmosis system in your house or your, or your drinking water. That's what we do. And then other toxins in the food supply, such as glyphosate, also worrisome too. So this paper by Stephanie Senoff states that glyphosate and aluminum work together synergistically in lower melatonin by damaging what's called the cytochrome P450 pathway. Now, glyphosate also blocks tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid that's a precursor to melatonin and serotonin, another important neurotransmitter. And glyphosate can also bind aluminum and take it across the gut barrier, causing even more damage and harm. 
And speaking of melatonin, it's also been found to lower amyloid plaque buildup from intermittent hypoxia in rats. Melatonin has also been shown to lower fluoride neurotoxicity in rats as well. However, if you think that you can apply it to humans, um, in this Cochrane study, it, they found that giving melatonin didn't have any effect on preventing dementia. I'm sure you see many more studies coming forward about this. And here's an interesting study showing that lower levels of vitamin D are associated with worse cognitive function and a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. So in summary, to live your life to the fullest and to lower your chances of developing dementia, here are the steps that I described today. Take your sleep seriously. If you have snoring or severe sleep apnea, just take care of it differently with your sleep doctor. And then good sleep hygiene, which we talked about before. Um, low carbohydrate diet, healthy fats. Review your medications if you take anything. Minimize toxins in food and water. And check your vitamin D level. Make sure the level is above 50 at least. And even if you're not too concerned about dementia, following these steps will definitely improve your health and overall quality of life. Now, before I take questions, I invite everyone listening to this who want to take your health to the next level, especially you want to take your sleep to the next level, to work with me as your trusted guide. You can schedule a free consultation call with me to see if we can work together and if I can help you. I'll place a link to schedule the consultation in the chat area. And I'll take you to the calendar so you can schedule it right away.